front. So um, to, uh, now we have um, Chris Zobrug and uh, Simon Houghton with us. Um, Chris works at uh, Sandek EWAG, uh, which has been doing amazing work uh, when it comes to um, solving waste management issues in developing countries, uh, not just waste management, but also sanitation and water issues in, in developing countries. And Simon works with a company called AgriProtein, uh, which is building um, black soldier fly larvae um, waste treatment um, um, plants, and that will pretty large scale plants. Um, uh, so, so I welcome both of you. And uh, and um, so today we'll, we'll talk about black soldier flies. Um, the reason we chose this topic was um, I, I um, so um, I was introduced to this topic mainly by um, Andy and uh, then spoke to multiple consultants and uh, all of them uh, were very hopeful that this technology could be a real um, addition to the toolkit that waste management all, already have. This is an additional tool that could work very well in the waste management toolkit in developing countries and also in, in, develop, in the developed world. So, um, so uh, welcome, Chris. Uh, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about your work, about the guide you, that you've published, about the videos that you have on YouTube, and um, a little bit about the technology itself? Yeah, love to. Thanks. Um, you hear me? Everything's fine? Everything's fine, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, so I come from a research institution. Uh, EABAG is a, is a research center. Uh, and in our department, we actually focus on, on water sanitation and waste management in low-income income countries or low-income settings. And um, so, first of all, what we have to say is that our research is very applied research. So we're always trying to look at kind of solutions, on one hand, solutions to existing problems, um, but also then in a way, in terms of visions, you know, what can be developed further, what, where do we see kind of the world moving towards, and what kind of we kind of anticipate and look for, look for um, solutions. And so in organic waste management, we've been working for ages, um, especially, I mean, as you all know, organic waste as a, as a largest fraction in developing country settings. Uh, so if we can find some ways of managing organic waste, then of course we can solve a big, pro uh, big chunk of the problem. And so we went through composting, we did a lot of work on decentralized composting, we worked on anaerobic digestion, biogas production, and, and, and we're always kind of, our, our push forward was always to find ways where we can increase the value of the organic material. Uh, as many of you know, compost in most settings, not all settings, but many settings has very low value. So it's kind of very difficult to get some revenue stream out of, out of this product that we're making from organic waste, so this compost product. So gas is much better, uh, has, a, has a higher potential in terms of energy and fuel, but still also faces limitations. First of all, gas is kind of difficult to transport uh, and to store. And then, of course, it faces kind of severe difficulties um, because energy is often very strongly subsidized, has very low cost, a low price. So competing with electricity, like from the, the grid, uh, makes it very difficult. And so biogas works often, and we, where we see it very successful is in, in off-the-grid systems, like Nepal, very rural Nepal settings that are not on the grid. That where, that's where biogas works ex in an excellent way. And, but we were, kind of, we were searching for more opportunities in the urban setting, uh, not really rural off-grid systems. And then we came across black soldier flies. And, and there, of course, um, and um, I'm sure, you know, Simon would agree, you know, there's a lot of potential in terms of the product. So product protein as feed, uh, animal feed. So animal consumption, meat consumption is increasing worldwide. Um, f oceans are being fished out. There are less and less fish. And actually that fish meal is often used for animal feed or so is soya. Uh, soya is used for animal feed, but of course, soya needs a lot of land, uh, intense, uh, also irrigation, so water consumption. So trying to find alternatives, on one way, trying to find an alternative for the, the problem of, of animal feed, and at the same time, finding a, a, a great alternative to solve, solve the organic waste problem. So also manage organic waste in a better way, and then kind of combine this together to make a product of value. 
Um, so our approach, and, and um, Simon will probably say, will come from a different angle. Our approach is, of course, from a research, a research point of view. So our mandate is to really make um, the material, the knowledge available to as many people as possible. Uh, we are trying to focus more on a small sector, on a micro, small and micro enterprise sector. Um, and because we think um, rapid replication all over and as, in as many cities as possible, even on neighborhood or um, city region scale, um, you know, if people see the opportunity of, of getting, of making some, making profit, making a business out of it, that, that can drive waste management. And, and then, so waste management does not become, um, the, the objective of waste management does not, is not only protecting public health and environment, but suddenly is doing that, and in addition, also uh, making, some, making some, some money. So that's kind of our starting point. And maybe I'll talk about a bit later about our, our projects, but we've been working now on, on Black Soldier Flies um, I would say off and on for, for about eight, eight to ten years. Uh, started off with a PhD um, thesis, looking at it in more detail, and then kind of going on from there. And now the research continues, but we're, we're at a stage where we really think we have a lot of information to share. And you mentioned it, we just recently published a step-to-step -step guide on really the operational, proce uh, operational procedures. And we, kind of, we try to set it up in a way like a cookbook recipe. So you, it really kind of tells you what to do, step one, you know, what to mix, similar to Jamie Oliver's cookbooks where they tell you first press, the, press out the lime, then mix it with the, with the tomatoes. And, you know, so really going step by step. We also have material lists of what to buy. Of course, that can vary from country to country, but we kind of give like a, a template um, and, uh, and we, we accompany the book um, with a small little video. Uh, you can see that on, you can download or, or watch it on YouTube, or you can, uh, you can also download the book uh, free of charge from our site. So that's kind of the, at the level we are. And at the moment, we're very much in this dissemination phase of, of course, one approach of how to do it. Um, you know, anyone, everyone can do it a bit differently. So there are variations in how to do it, but we felt we, had, we have proven with our, with our site, with our facility in Indonesia, that this works. So we felt, okay, this is the time to publish this and to make, make people aware of this is, this is how you can do it, and it works. We know it works. So why not make it um, public knowledge? Right, right. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. I think uh, that sets a very good context and kind of a pitch for, for um, the technology and the process. And um, so, um, Simon, welcome and um, welcome. Um, everyone on the, on the session today um, has been here earlier on previous Global Dialogues, but uh, you're the first okay. person who hasn't been, so welcome uh, and thanks Thank for you. joining us. And um, so, uh, since, uh, you know, Chris uh, put a very good context and, you know, kind of a pitch for, for, for you know, the Black Soldier Flight technology. So could you talk a little bit about what you're doing, you, the, the scale you're operating it, and the regions and geographies that you're focused on right now? Yeah, absolutely. So firstly, we, we, we would encourage uh, the small-scale um, expansion of, of, of using the Black Soldier Flies of technology. Um, we've just pitched ourselves as a business to to essentially solve a, a, a global problem um, as a business. And there are two issues that we have pitched ourselves at. One is the organic waste issue, and the other is the protein gap. Um, Agri-protein has been going about nine years. We have spent an incredible amount of time learning the biology. Uh, it's one thing rearing black soldier fly in a lab sort of size but to get them to um, breed and lay eggs uh, on a large scale, and I'm talking sort of a thousand cages, um, 365 days of the year um, across the globe is, is an another thing entirely. Um, typically a black soldier fly will only really mate and lay eggs um, in the spring and summer months. So, and that is because of the frequency of light um, that is that is uh, expressed over the curvature of the globe 
So we spent a long time mimicking that frequency of light to um, arrive at a situation where we could pretend that it was uh, summer 365 days of the year. Um, we, we've spent a lot of time coming out of a laboratory and into a large scale factory. We've made infinite number of mistakes. Um, recently, we, we uh, acquired a new shareholder. It's public knowledge who that is. It's uh, Christoph Industries in Austria. And they came to the DD in our business and we'd got large components of the biology to a point where we could industrialize them. Um, but we didn't have the engineering capability. Since then, they've come in and developed a Greenfields uh, engineering design, which we can deliver on an EPC basis um, anywhere in the world. Um, typically, these plants take in about 250 tons a day of organic waste, which equates to about 100,000 tons a year. So we are able to offer a city that has roughly a population of over a million people, we can offer them a waste disposal facility that can consume 100,000 tons of organic waste a year. Um, if you look at the uh, waste hierarchy pyramid, we've, we believe that we've pitched ourselves sort of in the reusing and recycling of, of, of food waste. So we think that our solution keeps food in the food chain. Um, unlike obviously landfill or even biodigestion. Um, let me talk a little about the global um, rollout. So we have in the next year to 18 months, we have sites opening up in Saudi Arabia, Johannesburg, which is our home country, uh, Vietnam, Dubai, um, South Korea. Uh, and um, we planning, we're gonna go through a series of capital raises over the next year or so. And we plan to have 100 of these plants up and running within a 10-year period. It's something that we're extremely excited about. I work with an incredibly passionate team. And um, on the product side, um, each factory will produce about 5,000 tons of protein, 3,000 tons of oil, and about 45,000 tons of composting feedstock which is we use a wet harvesting uh, methodology. So it's more of a slurry, which can be used either to pelletize as fertilizer or can be um, sent to composting farms. Um, there's another whole project development going on in terms of creating compost that becomes part of the soil inoculation uh, market, which is a newfound uh, research program. So that is in a nutshell what we're about. Right, right, great. Thank you, um, um, Simon. So, um, Chris, uh, do, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the you know, the, the, the bees themselves? You know, um, we talked about this during the test run, um, where they're native in the world, because I think this would be one question that many people would have. At least I thought it would be a big issue. Um, so where, where they live, where they're indigenous, and then also talk about what they eat and um, and uh, what about all the portion that they don't eat? Um, you know, how, how do we yeah. deal with that? And wh while you're doing that, can you also compare it with composting, whether it's a... Co uh, Simon um, in our test run mentioned that it's not a competition, but um, could you um, talk about that uh, a little bit? Yeah, love to. So um, in a way, in terms of um, where they're spread out, they're, they're practically global. Um, mm. they're, they're endemic in all temperate zones. So, of course, not in the cold regions. So, for instance, in Switzerland, uh, the northern part of the Alps, uh, where it's colder in the winters, they, they don't live in the wild. Uh, they are, they are uh, endemic in, in the southern part of Switzerland, so where, they can, where can they, they can survive the winter. And I think, um, in a way, so it's, it, I would say in most countries, it's not an issue of, of you know, introducing a new species you can actually collect them in the wild um, and you can start your colony uh, from a wild population if you wish to uh, so there i think that kind of maybe covers those concerns of you know introducing new species into a into an ecosystem which might have some damaging consequences um, you, can, <coughs> you, you can also you can also farm them in in uh, in this in i would say in a context 
where they're not endemic, but of course then you have some certain regulations you have to fulfill. So for instance, in our, in our lab setting or in our, in our setting in, in Zurich, to fulfill certain criteria of multiple barriers, we have to keep them indoors so they cannot escape. So you, 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 can, also get reg you can also get permits to do that. It just gets a bit more complicated. Um, and in the, in the, I would say in the, in the temperate tropical zone, I mean, they, what they really like is temperatures above 24 degrees, up to 30. Um, you know, the 25, 30 range, that's where they, that's, they love that. And, um, and then on, in the different life stages, they have different, different requirements. And uh, I mean, Simon uh, probably mentioned that it's quite, it's tricky to get, you know, to understand their life cycle and to, to learn about their life cycle. Uh, and to get those skills of how to engineer the life cycle. Uh, but once you can kind of get that, and that's, that's what we also with our book try to kind of um, transmit as well, is, is that complexity of the life cycle. Um, and your other question was what they, what they eat. So in a way, they eat food, food, um, food waste. That's excellent stuff. Um, there, are, there is information on what they prefer to eat and what they don't. What we know is that they can't, they can't eat uh, woody waste, so highly um, cellulosic, lignosic waste. They have difficulties because they just don't have the mouth parts to digest it. So you would have to, yeah, you would have to include a pretreatment step to break it down. What we usually do in our in our facilities is we we chop we chop all the waste. Um, they they can in terms of moisture ranges, they like it moist. And Simon was saying they have like a wet, a wet feeding system, more like a slurry. Uh, we noticed that there, there is a limit. So when, when they start swimming too much in the waste, they don't develop as fast. Now that might, that might be a trade-off of using a, a slurry in terms of operational processes that, you know, is easier to manage because then you can pump the stuff and, and it, there are some, and, and so you, that's a trade-off and you say, okay, then they, de they might not develop as fast but at least it's easier to manage. So you can, you can take that trade off. We noticed we're trying to follow a bit of approach where we, if it's too wet, we dewater the waste just by gravity. We just let it, let the water seep out a bit, uh, or we kind of have a, a waste mixture, which, which is not too, too wet. And that facilitates our, our, our residue, the, the stuff that remains. So the food, the, the waste that is consumed, it's a bit easier to manage from our from our perspective because you can compost it, you can you can kind of shovel it. It's 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 more easy easy to 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 use in in the later stage. Um, what else? I think there are some different substances where we see what they like more and what they like less. Uh, we also did uh, work with excreta because, of course, we'd like to explore the sanitation market as well or the 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 option to use excreta. So what they grow less on, on wastewater sludge. Um, and that seems logical because there's less, less protein, less food in, in a digested sludge. Uh, they also, excreta, they, they grow well. So you can also feed them excreta. Um, and yeah, that's about it. So uh, slaughterhouse waste, they love right. slaughterhouse waste. Um, and but of course there you have the issue of of meat waste, uh, you know, and and called the whole cycle of of food and meat waste. We don't think it's much of a problem. I think that probably needs a bit more research in terms of risk risk components. Right, right, okay, great, thank you, um, um, Simon. Uh, so um, uh, based on my questions with both of you, I mean, I hear a lot of consensus here on you know the um, the um, the technology and process. So, Simon, um, do you have any comments or thoughts on um, what um, Chris um, spoke about, or or should we move to the next question? No, I just wanted to correct uh, Chris, and just in terms of what I was saying earlier, I was saying that we have a wet harvesting methodology in terms of how we harvest the oh, lava, okay. which 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 uh, by by default creates a wet slurry to be used as compost. Our feeding plant, which we which we call lava lunch, is is a has a high moisture content. It's about seventy percent up to seventy five percent maximum, and um, we obviously want to put our plants down in areas where we can harness uh, as much waste as we can. And if there would be at any site, typically a 
one way stream that is dominant, whether it's a brewer's grain or chicken manure. I was speaking to a client yesterday. They have a chicken farm that has a thousand tons a day of chicken manure. We can include that into the larva diet, but only to an inclusion rate of about 30%. But typically, a black soldier fly is very similar to humans. They require 10 to 15% of protein, 70% carbohydrate. They need a lipid uh, portion and a fat portion as well as a fiber portion. So you do get different bioconversions. And when you put a big plant up, our plants are typically $30 million uh, units. Uh, the the bioconversion rate is a key number for us. So we try to get as close as we can to our maximum bioconversion because that relates back to the products that we sell. On the basis that we earn a gate fee for disposing of the waste, which is 90% of the cases we do, uh, we're not too concerned about the about the bioconversion because then we are simply a waste treatment plant. Um, so that we can move on. That's pretty much it. Okay, okay, great. Wonderful. And um, Simon, so uh, when we spoke last time, you, um, uh, you said that um, this is not a technology that will compete with others, but then it's kind of kind of fits very well in the hierarchy or with existing waste management systems like composting. So um, can you um, talk very quickly, say where it fits and you know how it fits? And then also talk a little bit about um, are there any other problems um, from you know, a system like this? Um, I, I imagine there will not be, but uh, in practice, um, are there any odor problems uh, from this time? Are there any odor problems? Right, yeah. Sure. I think when you're dealing with, with any, any organic waste, um, particularly mixtures of organic waste, uh, you will have an odor problem. In our plant here in Cape Town, we try to minimize it, but if we don't manage it on a daily basis and we don't have someone that's you know, looking after it, um, there is an odor problem. Um, but it's you manage it like any other engineering process. Um, in terms of, uh, what was the other question you asked me? Um, so uh, in terms of where it fits in the existing uh, infra yeah, waste. So I made reference to to the waste hierarchy, which is a, uh, a basically a management structure as to how we should handle food and drink and organic waste as a, as a species. And it starts off with the most desirable way to handle it, which is to either prevent it or reuse it to the least desirable um, way to treat it, which is to put it onto a landfill site, which we all know have various environmental um, repercussions. So we sit, I think, in my own opinion, in the reusing and the recycling band of that, uh, of that waste hierarchy. Um, I was also also asking with existing infrastructure with composting, how could it work together with composting? You know, um, that was the question. Right. Okay. So, so we have a an in vessel composting business next to our site here in Cape Town, and they are adjacent to a fruit and vegetable market. One of their problems is they accept the fruit and veg uh, waste on a daily basis, which provides them with an inconsistent waste stream because some days there's a lot more fruit, other days there's a lot more green and leafy uh, waste. And essentially what lands up happening is it has a, a, a down the line domino effect in his in vessel composting. So what we've done is we take the, um, the fruit and veg waste, produce lava lunch, because we can use that up to an inclusion of about 80%. And then we provide him back the um, mag slurry, which is highly active. It's been digested through the gut of, of, of lava. It's almost a 422 makeup in terms of nitrogen, potassium, and, and uh, phosphate. And he has a very stable feedstock that he can work with in his business. So it's a very, sim it's a very worthwhile symbiotic relationship between our business and his. And it's something that I see us rolling out um, with every one of our plants across the globe. Right, right. Okay. Um, um, and next, I would like to uh, discuss markets markets with you. But before that, um, I'll ask um, Chris a little bit about, um, uh, you know, what kind of um, uh, response are you seeing for, for your guide and for, for your um, 
uh, you know, the knowledge products that you've put out there, you know, who are responding and what kind of response are you seeing to them? Yeah, uh, very good response, uh, lots of response. It's a bit overwhelming. We need to kind of um, back down a bit because we, are, we have to still continue in managing our projects. And if we, uh, well, if we only respond to, res to, uh, to questions, um, uh, I think then we'll do nothing else. So we, we could probably just open a consultancy, just <laughs> consulting mm. on, on people wanting to, to, to put this into operation, which we're not doing. But so um, what, what we have now set up in Indonesia is because there's our, our target focus from the project in Indonesia is, of course, on Indonesia. That's kind of defined by our donor. We would like to support the Indonesian waste management context as a higher priority. And of course, our research objectives are to go to also uh, provide the information globally. But from a project perspective, it's, it's mainly focused on Indonesia. And there, we're, we're setting up a system that people that are interested, um, they have different options. Either they can, they can do internships on our facility, so they can come and visit, they can see how it's done. They can, uh, they can either just come for a day or they can do a one month of, of, of internship. So where, they, where they're kind of included in our daily processes. So they learn every step of the way. They learn the whole life cycle. And, and maybe that's important to mention. Um, and, and that's a bracket here. Uh, just to mention this, what we feel is, you know, the skills, the skill set that are needed to really operate something like this. Uh, they're quite significant, and Simon was also saying it, you need to learn a lot about the life cycle. Uh, the, the flies, you know, how to make sure that you always have larvae, uh, small larvae ready, that you can, you can give, give waste to, uh, making sure that you have enough eggs, that the, that the flies mate. You know, that cycle is, is, is a bit more complex. You need, you need to know about the life cycle of the flies, you need to know what the conditions are, what, what things, what, what goes, if something goes wrong, how you can adapt, how you can, how you can, um, you know, find some solutions. That's the, that's a more tricky part where you need more skills. On the waste side, on the waste treatment side, so once you do have the small larvae and you have a good waste supply, then, you know, feeding the larvae with waste is pretty straightforward. We have, we have a daily routine of what, how, how much you feed per day, in what kind of density we do this in crates so that can actually that doesn't need that much skills i mean of course it needs some skills but it's not so complex as the nursery right so we're trying to provide more the internships and the knowledge uh, on the hands-on experiences on the nursery part and right. that's what we're that's what we're doing okay uh, we're, what, we're, what we're also providing is for those people that are interested like starter packages so right. they can they're lot they can get from us like a, a, a set of a certain amount of small larvae and where they can start um, the rearing process themselves. Um, I'm really interested in understanding you know um, how you're doing what Simon uh, was saying about the life cycle you know um, creating summer throughout the year. But uh, we have only 15 minutes and I really want to get to the markets and the sourcing part of it. Um, so, um, Simon, could you talk a little bit about the markets for your products um, and, um, and, and, and the demand that you have and how, how do you choose markets, etc.? Could, could you talk about that a little bit? And then we'll go to Chris to talk about the sourcing of the waste because I know that that's a major problem in developing countries for the sourcing. Please go ahead, Simon. So, we have three products. The, the most bulky one is our, is our composting um, product which we call mag soil uh, that is a localized product you because we're producing roughly 80 tons a day of it per plant we have to sell that locally so we develop those markets on a per site basis in terms of our mag meal and the mag oil product the mag meal is destined for the aquaculture industry we're dealing with um, the top three or four aquaculture uh, feed suppliers we have trials ongoing with them. And um, if we just only service that market, um, we still won't build enough factories to service it. On the oil side, we, if we, even if we sell it as a, as a, for its calorific value as, as, as an energy source, we would have hit our target price. It has cosmetic 
value, believe it or not. Um, it, it's very high in lauric acid. And it really is going to be a question of how we desensitize um, the market uh, uh, on an ongoing basis. We have another business which uh, uh, Christian was uh, leading to earlier on um, called the BioCycle, which is funded by the Bill and Belinda Gates Foundation, which we feed black soldier fly on, on human fecal matter. That leaves us with a, uh, another product which is very similar to activated carbon. It has an incredible ability to retain um, uh, scents and um, we are doing studies with some of the leading um, sanitation businesses worldwide uh, to create products there. So and back to agri-protein in terms of our oil and, uh, and our mag meal, we are currently focusing on on the aqua industry, so salmon, shrimp, um, not so much tilapia, um, caviar market. Uh, so we have a we have an overwhelming demand for products that we produce, and we have uh, any number of organisations attempting to take 100% of our production. It's not good business sense to give any client 100%. So we sort of navigating those waters uh, on an ongoing basis. Wonderful. That's that's amazing to learn that uh, we could finally find products, uh, markets for products made of organic waste, uh, which has been. Well, you see, you see, nobody's ever mass reared insects. So if yeah. you want to start supplying a big enterprise like Cargill, for instance, they they would like a global supplier. You can't be an agri-protein and only be in Africa and hope to supply cargo. They want to know that over a period of 10 years, you will develop into a global supply chain. Otherwise, you technically can't uh, do business with them. And all of these big players, kind of whether you deal with the Mars Corporation, Nestle, any of the big pet food companies outside of Mars, you will land up with the same problem. You need to be a global player. Yeah, right. that, that, that's very insightful. Um, so um, uh, I'll just uh, remind um, viewers that um, uh, we were watching Chris Zerbrug and uh, Simon Houghton uh, talk about black soldier fly larvae. Um, this is a new, um, not a new, but uh, it's a very uh, interesting uh, new tool in the waste management toolkit. And um, if you have any questions, um, use the Q&A box uh, below the screen and um, send them in. And uh, you can also tweet to us at uh, be waste wise, or you can use the hashtag waste dialogue. And uh, we have um, another session coming up tomorrow called the collective action. Uh, we believe a large um, global challenges like waste can only be solved when all of us take um, steps towards you know solving it. So for collective action, we're bringing in uh, people working on environmental justice, environmental racism, and we're also bringing in um, two teenagers who founded a, a nonprofit. And we're also, uh, we also have Marcus Erickson talk about his um, um, book called um, uh, Junk, uh, well, uh, about his book um, called uh, Junkraft. I think that, I can't remember the name right now, but uh, uh, it, it talks about the rising uh, tide of activism. So um, um, tune in tomorrow, you can register on the website and you can do, th do that. Um, but uh, let, let's go back to um, Chris and then um, talk a little bit about the sourcing of the waste because that's a real problem in, um, uh, in developing countries, mainly on how you could source that um, uh, um, high quality organic waste. So um, Chris, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, it's something that we, we see that we, we're also facing um, in a way in Indonesia. So in Indonesia, our facility takes uh, vegetable and uh, we're, so we're attached to a vegetable market and a fruit, uh, fruit market. So we're getting quite well sorted, I would say very nicely sorted vegetable and fruit waste. So actually, and we did that on purpose because we didn't want to get too much into the waste sourcing in terms of, because we were, we were interested in developing the process of, of, of um, with the flies uh, and with the larvae. So, but now uh, it kind of, it, it comes to the point where you say, okay, um, if you, if you cherry pick the good waste, the easy to access waste from maybe fruit industry um, or from such vegetable markets, of course, that's easy waste to access. So quite at a low cost. 
um, it's, it's already well sorted. So it has, I would say, a high quality in terms of, of waste quality, which then, of course, leads also to the quality of the larvae. Um, but now the question is, you know, if you really want to make uh, a change in waste management, in municipal solid waste management, which where we know the biggest mass of waste is actually household waste. That's, that's the big chunks of waste, you know, uh, is, is household waste. So now the question is, how can you get the organic fraction from the households? And that is, of course, a big challenge. Uh, it's a big challenge because then you start need to, you need to engage with uh, campaigning. You need to awareness uh, was mentioned in the sessions before. You know, you need to start going on to the community level, trying to motivate and convince households to segregate at the source so that you can access that organic fraction. Unless you decide to sort everything on your facility, at, like post-ante sorting, which of course increases, increases your cost tremendously uh, of manual sorting or even mechanical sorting and reduces the quality because you'll always have um, contaminants in it. So, so there I just, I noticed that, you know, the whole sector of black soldier fly operation, waste treatment operation, um, in a way it really needs a collaboration with the government. Because if you really want to work on this community level, if you want to organize a household segregation, that, that necessitates an involvement of the municipality, of the communities. So really then you can't, you can't kind of go independent. You have to work together with the municipalities. We were lucky in Surabaya now to really get the city interested. So they, were, they, they visited our site, the, the waste management department visited our site and said, okay, this is something uh, we're already engaging on household waste segregation in different communities. Now, would that be an option that we use your treatment option on that organic waste? Because we don't have much space and composting needs quite a lot of space. We would like to reduce our, our space footprint. Black soldier fly is actually ideal because you can you can manage it vertically, and and so so this collaboration came up now that we're kind of giving them technical expertise to, which as I said before is quite simple, which could even be in the neighborhood where they get where they have household segregated waste, and then we can think of a, of a model where the nursery is off site in a more central location which supplies the small larvae, the treatment happens in the neighborhoods, and then the large larvae, when they've grown, are again collected. So rather than transporting waste, we're transporting the larvae, central facility. That means the central facility would rear, uh, would supply lar small larvae, collect large larvae, process and market the larvae. And the waste management, so the larvae treatment, waste treatment, would happen in the neighborhoods, con connected to a community initiative with a waste segregation. So that would also kind of motivate the people to see, okay, this is what's happening with my waste. This is why I'm doing it, you know, to kind of get the level of motivation to do actually this, this job. So it, it could even, we could even think about models of financial incentives, you know, that they're, that they're getting something back for the community in this exchange for growing the larvae. So we, I think this is a very exciting model, but it really needs this community level, this municipality engagement. And, and because we really need, uh, uh, we need, uh, sorry, I, my, my screen just went cockeyed there. Uh, and we really need this involvement with, um, and we need good waste. We need household segregated waste. And then we can make a, a big uh, impact on, on waste management for the whole city, because we can replicate this scheme throughout the city. Right, right. Thanks, Chris. Um, as you fix the screen, I'll, I'll move to um, Simon. And um, Simon, so um, how, where do you source your waste? I mean, so can you quickly say, um, you know, where, where you source your waste and, um, and if you have any comments on what Chris said? Until now. So we are tooled up to um, accept municipal solid waste. Um, and I agree, it's a it's a massive problem in terms of separating it and decontaminating it. Uh, but ultimately, we know that's where the final game will be. Uh, in some countries, it's a lot easier to accept it than others. 
uh, various municipalities are way ahead of the game in comparison to others. Uh, for example, South Korea, probably the most advanced, they have a reverse vending system where households uh, put their organic waste into little bags and put them into vending machines. They charge the fee and then the, the city essentially auctions the waste off and pays the um, disposal company to do that. Um, we, we're also geared up to take on industrial waste. Our Saudi Arabian plant will be put into an industrial site where there's many, many hundreds of tons of waste, uh, whether it's from bakery, um, uh, uh, chip manufacturers. We have a site in, in Johannesburg where just one industrial site produces 70 tons a day of potato peels. So we we geared up to take post and pre-consumer waste. Uh, we know that uh, modern cities have placed um, targets to have zero waste or 50 percent less waste to landfill by certain dates. So we're going to be right there to participate in the organic fraction of that. And it does. It boils down to awareness and consciousness in in, in every household to you know separate the waste. And I think that'll come over time. Um, so, and there are companies that are doing it successfully currently, um, waste companies that we're plugging into at the moment. But it'll it will evolve over time. I think it will get better rather than worse. Right. Right. Okay. And um, do you have any final comments? And then we'll move to Chris. Uh, we have only two minutes, so. No, no, I'm good. We can we can move to Chris. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us, Simon and uh, Chris. Um, any final thoughts? We have two minutes. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll mute you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, actually not. I, I think it was it was it was great. Thanks for having me here. It was uh, great also to meet you, Simon. I think we'll probably have more exchange in the future. So that I'm excited to see what you are. And I mean, I think our our, our different our different approaches. What you were saying to, in terms of waste sourcing, I I completely agree. Uh, what we, t of course, see is that the more developed countries like South Korea, um, you know, they have these systems which are coming on, on household separation. The, mm. the countries that we're working in, unfortunately, um, are not so, that's not so well developed. So that's why I think there's, uh, there's some catching up to do. But I think if we can show the population, if we can show the people the benefit and what kind of, what the what value is created and what the benefits are of, of making something out of this organic fraction, we can really also uh, attract attention to really separating waste and, and to make this possible. Absolutely. So that would be my, finally word, my final words, really. OK, all right, great. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, Simon, anything? But then we can end it here. Yeah. yeah, I know. Thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed participating. Um, thank you. Great, wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Simon. Thanks, um, Chris. Thanks, Andy and Mike and Brian. Um, it was a great session today. Um, we heard from people from all around the world about you know um, practicing waste management and what kind of experience that they go through. And uh, we have another session um, on a similar theme um, happening on the eighth of September. And you, you'll again hear from people around the world, um, you know, what kind of challenges they're facing and how they're overcoming them. And um, tomorrow we have, um, like I mentioned earlier, a session on collective action. And um, for those who are viewing, if, you, if you're learning anything from all of this and if you're liking what you're watching, then please share. And um, sharing is you know, probably the first step, of, um, first step towards um, change and taking leadership. So do that. And um, again, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, remember that um, you know, we, we face planetary challenges, uh, our generation especially. And, uh, you know, all of us should be ready to, you know, take uh, leadership ahead. I'm um, sorry, take uh, leadership and then take a step ahead. And when you want to do that, whenever you're ready, um, I think Be Waste Wise will have the resources, the knowledge resources that will help you take the next step ahead, uh, 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 that will guide you take the next step. So um, thank you again and um, have a good day, good night and good evening, wherever you're in the world. So thanks, guys. <laughs>